Hello, this is Dr. Joe Trout from the physics program at this Richard Stockton College in New Jersey. In this lecture, we'll discuss Chapter 15, which deals with climate and climate change. A good portion of the scientific community believes that the present global warming trend is largely due to human activity. Principally, the combustion of fossil fuels which is responsible for the carbon dioxide and other infrared absorbing gases in the atmosphere. It's believed that the amount of CO2 already emitted into the atmosphere ensures a magnitude of warming that will cause an unacceptable rise in sea level in some localities. Particularly vulnerable are the to rising sea levels are the island nations. So how and why does the climate change? Well the climate changes over a broad range of time scales from years to millennia and there's many forcing forces working together that are responsible for climate change. A big contribution in, is the variability in the available solar energy. We also have volcanic eruptions, changes in the Earth's surface properties, and human activities. Climate we define as the weather of some locality averaged over some time period plus the extremes in weather and these vary spatially and temporally. They're described quantitatively in terms of normals, means, and extremes of the weather elements including wind, temperature, and precipitation. NOAA's National Climatic Data Center, the NCDC, collects data from the National Weather Service, processes it, and archives it and makes it available to users. When we talk about the climatic norm, we're talking about the average value of some climatic element and it encompasses, encompasses the total variation in the climate record including both averages plus extremes so maximum and minimum temperatures for instance. The computed averages of the weather elements are averaged over a 30 year time period and they're adjusted every 10 years adding in the latest decade and dropping off the oldest decade. In the United States 30 year averages are done for temperature, precipitation, and air pressure. When studying the climate it's sometimes useful to look at the climatic anomalies these are departures from the long-term climatic averages. So a positive anomaly would be a value above the long-term average, and a negative anomaly would be a value below the long-term average. Not surprisingly, precipitation anomalies are usually form more complex patterns than temperature anomalies. This is due to the variability of storm tracks and the almost random distribution of convective storms. Living in New Jersey, I'm sure you've seen times when it'll be pouring in Galloway and it'll be sunny and dry in, a, in Egg Harbor. We find that the middle and high latitudes have a geographic non-uniformity of climatic anomalies. This is due to the prevailing westerly wave pattern that we spoke of a couple of chapters ago. So the top graph shows departures of average temperatures from the normal in degrees Fahrenheit. So the blue, blue shows the negative anomalies and the pink or red shows the positive anomalies. The bottom graph shows anomalies 
in percent of normal precipitation. So anything that's at 100% or above is in a darker green. Anything below 100% is in a lighter green. You can see that the anomalies for the temperature seem a little more organized than the anomalies of the precipitation. There's boundary conditions are imposed on the climate due to the latitude, the elevation, the topography, proximity to large bodies of water, there are surface characteristics. The long-term average atmospheric circulation and a prevailing ocean circulation. So we'll discuss each one of these in detail. First, if we look at the latitude, as hopefully you know by now, the incubular solar radiation and the length of the day varies as the latitude changes. And the Earth's surface temperature, of course, responds to these variations. If you look at the elevation, the temperature drops with increasing elevation. The topography affects the distribution of clouds and precipitation. The proximity of large bodies of water is important in the storage and exchange of heat, water, and greenhouse gases. So as we said, the temperature on the land changes much faster than the temperature of the oceans and seas. We also look at the Earth's surface ca characteristics. So ocean versus land, vegetation cover, and semi-permanent snow and ice. And these influence the amount of solar radiation that is converted to heat. So the amount that's reflected straight back out into the atmosphere or back out into space and the amount that's absorbed. Of course, atmospheric circulation will affect the climate. And this influences all weather systems. And these are less regular and less predictable than other factors. We also have prevailing ocean currents, which we've discussed through the semester. And these influences radiational heating and cooling of the planet. So it's the primary control for the amount of solar radiation that's absorbed at the Earth's surface. And the ocean is the main source of most greenhouse gas, the most important greenhouse gas, which is water vapor. And it's also a major regulator of CO2. So it can store CO2. It also transfers heat from the lower latitudes to the higher latitudes. So from the equator northward and from the equator southward. If we look at temperature, we know that the latitude of the highest mean annual surface temperature, the heat equator, is located about 10 degrees north of the geographic equator. So the heat equator is located in the northern hemisphere, and the polar regions have different radiational characteristics. So for example, the Arctic is warmer than the Antarctic, and the Arctic is mostly ocean, and the Antarctic is ice sheets. And the ice sheets have a higher albedo, or a higher percentage of reflected energy, than the water does. The northern hemisphere has more land than the southern hemisphere, which will change the climate, because the land warms much faster than the, o than the water and the land cools much faster than the water. 
We also see that ocean circulation transports more warm water to the northern hemisphere than to the southern hemisphere. These systematic patterns appear in January and July temperatures, so isotherms tend to be parallel to the latitude circles. Any isotherms shift north and south from January to July, and they follow the sun. Once again, since the land changes faster than the ocean does, there's a greater shift over land. The steeple of the isothermal gradients, which can be seen by the, isotherm, the isotherm's lines being close together, mean more vigorous circulation and stormier weather in the winter hef hemisphere. So here we see the mean sea level air temperature for January in degrees C. And here we see the mean sea level temperature, air temperature for July in degrees C. What you'll notice is that if you look at the winter vers versus the summer, we see that the lines of constant temperature are closer together especially over the land masses in the winter than in the summer. So this is going to mean more stormy weather in the winter as I'm sure you've experienced. Also notice that near the equator the temperature doesn't change very much between the winter and summer. So there are slight variations, but it remains reasonably constant. If we look at the precipitation, the variability in patterns is due to the typo topography and the distribution of land and sea, and the planet planetary scale circulation. So of course we have the intertropical conversion zone the ITCZ and rainfall in the adjacent belt poleward to about 20 degrees latitude depends on the seasonal shifts of the intertropical convergence zone. We also have subtropical cyclones or anticyclones that dominate the climate all year between 20 and 35 degrees north and south. The prevailing winds patterns between about 35 and 40 degrees latitude, the prevailing westerlies and subtropical anticyclones gobble, govern the precipitation. Precipitation generally declines polewards of about 40 degrees latitude as the lower temperatures reduce the amount of precipitable water. There's also a tendency in the continental interiors for more precipitation in the summer. So here we see the mean annual precipitation, rain plus melted snow in millimeters. There's various ways to classify climates. The first is on a meteorological basis of climate. So you ask why the climate type occurs where they do. We can also look at the environmental effects of climate. So we can infer the climate from the type of plants and the environmental indicators, such as the distribution of indig indigenous vegetation. There's also numerical climate classification schemes that are employed that use statistical methods. So, so the climate varies from place to place and with time. The reconstruction of the past, the climate of the past, is based on historical documents and longer term 
geological and biological evidence. So if we look at geological time, we see that general conclusions made regarding the climate over geological time. And the geological past is subdivided into geological time scale. Plate tectonics complicates the climate reconstruction by moving continents and opening and closing sea basins or ocean basins. So you have to worry about things like the continental drift. And this alters the course of heat transporting surface currents and the ocean conveyor belt system. So here we see the geological time scale. And it goes by millions of years ago. So we start with about 0.01 millions of years ago where the ice age ends. And we go down to the earliest fo fossil records, which is about 3,800 millions of years ago. So about 225 million years ago, the supercontinent split up and separated into comp continents that slowly drifted apart and the ocean basins opened and eventually continents reached their present position. But this continental drift is responsible for climate changes operating over hundreds of millions of years. So it's not something you're going to record easily in your lifetime. If we look at 570 million years ago, we had an abrupt climatic changes between extreme cold and tropical heat. So we had global warming. From about 245 to 70 million years ago, it remained relatively warm. Then the global mean temperature rose about 3 to 4 degrees between the Triassic and Jurassic periods. Once again, the temperatures rose between 6 and 8 degrees higher than now. And about 55 million years ago, methane released by deep sea sediment enhanced the greenhouse effect. And 40 million years ago saw a shift towards colder, drier, and more variable climate. In the past two million years, plate tectonics was not a major factor. And the climate has favored the development of glacier ice sheets. This is known as its glacial theory. About 1.7 million years ago, uh, we had an ice age that began and it culminated about 10,500 years ago. The ice sheets caused the, caused the sea level to drop by about 113 to 135 meters, so about 370 to uh, 443 feet. There was a land bridge exposed linking Siberia and Alaska And during the interglacial episodes, ice sheets thin and retreated and sometimes disappeared completely. During these glacial episodes, temperatures were cooler than today, but cooling was not geographically uniform. We also had polar amplification so we had an increase in the magnitude of the climatic change with increasing latitude. Chart A shows the variations in global glacier ice volume from present back to about 600 million years ago. So you can see it was not constant 
and it changed off and on. But this was a very long time scale. In chart B, we show the change in temperature in degrees C with the temperature variations over the past 160,000 years. If we look, try to figure out the climatic record, we can look at the extent of glacier ice that cover over the North America at about 20,000 to about 18,000 years ago. This was the time of the last glacial maxima. So for the past two million years, fluctuations between the major glacier and the interglacier climatic episodes over the six to 600,000 years. And the last major glacier climatic episode began about 27,000 years ago, reaching its peak about 18,000 to 20,000 years ago. Over the past thousand years, there's been a medieval warm period from about 950 to 1250 AD, followed by a cooling known as the Little Ice Age about 1400 to 1850 AD. We can also look at instrument-based temperature change trends. So we had the invention of weather instruments and establishment of weather observing network made climate records much more detailed and dependable. Our highest confidence is in temperature records dating back from the late 1800s with the birth of the National Weather Service along with the founding of the International Meteorological Association, which today is the WMO. The examinations of temperature change over the past 140 years or so is instructive as to the climate variability and climate change. And the general consensus in the scientific com community holds that the overall global scale warming trend has prevailed since the end of the Little Ice Age. So it's important to understand that the climate is inherently variable over a broad spectrum of time scales ranging from years to decades to centuries to millennia. Variations in the climate are geographically non-uniform in both sign and direction and magnitude. And some areas may experience warming while others experience cooling. And a climate change may consist of long-term change in various climatic elements and or in a change in the frequency of extreme weather events. So for example, are we getting more or fewer hurricanes? And are these hurricanes stronger or weaker? Climate change tends to be abrupt rather than gradual. There's also a few cyclic variations that can be discerned from the long-term climate, climate record. So regular cycles, such as diurnal and seasonal variations, and incoming solar radiation, and quasi-regular variations, such as El Nino. So the climate change can also impact society. In this chart, we can see the time scale and the, climbing force, the climate forcing. 
We should note that El Nino may account for climate shifts lasting several months. So we see that the, the evolution of the air and sea, we're talking about time scales of 10 to the 9th years. Plate tectonics, we're talking about 100,000 years. Orbital variations, 10,000 years. Human activity can have an effect from zero years to 10,000 years. And El Nino and La Nina can affect from months to years. And volcanoes can have an effect from months to hundreds of years. The energy output from the sun, of course, is not constant. It's not absolutely constant. And for example, we have sunspots. And a sunspot is a dark splotch on the face of the sun, which are relatively cool. Typically, they last for a few days, and their total number varies systematically. And we have satellites monitoring that reveals the sun energy output varies directly with the sunspot number. So this shows the variations in mean and annual sunspot numbers and it's pretty accurate starting from about 1700 to present. And as you can see they're highly variable. Some years we can get a mean annual sunspot number of about 160 to 200 and some years we get almost none. We also see changes in the Earth's orbit. So for example, the eccentricity of our elliptical orbit changes slightly. Also the tilt of the Earth, remember we said that we our summer and winter is caused by the Earth tilting back and forth towards the Sun and away from the Sun. And this has regular variations. And this the tilt can change from 22.1 degrees to 24.5 degrees. But it takes about 41,000 years to do so. The reason for these changes are due to the gravitational influence exerted by the Earth, on the Earth, by other large planets, and the Moon and the Sun. We also get a slight wobble, which is a change in axial precession. So like when a top starts to, when you, if you have a top that's spinning and it starts to die and you can see it start to wobble, the Earth does the same, has the same um, problem. So these are known as the, the Milankovitch cycles and we're looking at eccentricity and precession and tilt and we can see we're talking about time scales of 0 to 50,000 years. Volcanoes can also affect the climate. So we have only explosive eruptions rich in sulfur dioxide, SO2, are likely to impact global or hemispheric climate for a few years at the most. What happens is that, they, that the SO2 combines with water vapor and droplets of sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and sulfate particles form together with sulfuric, with sulfurous aerosols and they can remain in the stratosphere for many months. They also absorb incoming solar and outgoing infrared radiation warming the lower stratosphere and in the presence of chlorine can destroy ozone. 
Here we see a temperature anomalies in Fahrenheit degrees in the Midwest during June and July of August of 1992. If we look at the combination of stratospheric warming and the ozone depletion, this strengthens the circumpolar vortex. And this is associated with non-uniform change in surface temperature. So whenever we have a violent sulfur rich eruption is likely is unlikely to lower the mean hemispheric or global temperature by more than a degree. And that's a degree Celsius. So local and regional temperature changes might be greater. We also see the climate can be affected by the Earth's surface properties. And if these properties change, then the climate can change. So the Earth's surface comprised approximately a 71% ocean is a prime absorber of solar radiation. But changes in the physical properties of the land, the water or land surface, or relative distributions of the ocean and land or sea ice may affect the Earth's radiation budget and the climate. So we can see variations in snow cover. So the snow has, a, as we said, has a refrigerating effect on the atmosphere. And it also reflects about 80% of the solar radiation. It also emits radiation, radiating heat into space. If we look at changes in sea ice or glacial ice coverage, these have longer lasting impacts on the climate. So ice is much more reflect re reflective of incident solar radiation than ocean or snow-free land. And changes in, sulf in sea surface temperature and ocean circulation. So the sea surface temperature patterns can exert a strong influence on the location of major features of the atmospheric atmosphere's planetary scale circulation. Now we look at human activity and climate change. As we modify the landscape, if we start clearing forest and urbanization, this alters the reflective properties of the Earth's surface. Also, the combustion of fossil fuels, this alters the concentrations of gases and aerosols. And this would believe that the rising concentrations of CO2 and other infrared absorbing gases enhance the greenhouse effect in contributing to global warming. There was a rapid rise in CO2 at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And it was actually Fourier of the Fourier analysis that first predicted global warming from this increased CO2. There's also a rise in other infrared absorbing gases, such as meth methane and nitrous oxide, and this could enhance the greenhouse effect. So methane is a product of organic decay, and nitrous oxide increases are likely due to industrial air pollution. So here we see the radiative, radiative forcing components and their time scale and the and but their effect is in radiative forcing in watts per meter squared. It also shows on what their spatial scale is. So for example, if we look at long-term lived greenhouse gases, we can see that their spatial scale is global. If we look at things with like solar irradiation, ir radiance, it's also global but it's, it has a lot less effect. Linear contrails can be continental, so these are clouds that are formed from the exhaust of planes. 
and they have a relatively low impact. So how do we check and see what the, how the climate's doing? We can use global climate models, GCMs, and these simulate the Earth's climate systems. Just like weather models, they use mathematical equations that describe the physical interactions among various components of the climate system. They differ from numerical weather models in that they predict broad regions of expected positive and negative temperatures and precipitation anomalies and mean locations of circulation features. So for example, they're used to predict potential climate impacts of rising levels of greenhouse gases by using boundary conditions. So in the model, it's easy to add some extra greenhouse gases and see what will happen. The CGMs, the GCMs, are in need of considerable refinement because we have to keep studying this important feedback processes that we don't know a lot about. We also need a greater resolution. So the more data points we can put into the model, the higher the resolution and the better our answer will be, or the better our prediction will be. We also search for cycles and analogs. So the climate record is an alternative approach for predicting the climate future. And we use instrument-based and reconstructed climate records and probe in search of regular cycles that might be extended in the future. And, the a and analogs that show how the climate in specific regions respond to global scale climate change. And the identification of many statistically significant periodicities or trends in the, in the climate record would be a powerful tool in climate forecasting. When we talk about the enhanced greenhouse effect and a global warming, we expect that over the next 10,000 to 20,000 years, the Milankovitch cycles favor return to the ice age conditions. And rising concentrations of greenhouse gases are likely to cause global warming to continue throughout this century. So the climate models predict that over subsequent 20 years, the global mean annual, annual temperature will increase at a rate of about 0.2 Celsius degrees per decade. And even if the greenhouse gas emissions were to stabilize at present, global warming would likely continue well beyond the 21st century. This can cause sinking glaciers and rising sea levels, and the persistence of the current global warming trends appear likely to cause sea levels to rise in response to melting of land based polar ice sheets and mountain glaciers coupled with the thermal expansion of seawater. Amplifications of the warming trend at higher latitudes would threaten the ice sheets of the Antarctica and Greenland and melting could cause a considerable rise in sea level. Yokan sees the shrinkage of mountain glaciers and ice fields whose seasonal, whose seasonal would be a major concern. And as people, livestock, and crops relies on the seasonal runoff for fresh water. We also have thermal expansion of warming seawater will be a great contributor to the main sea level rise And higher main sea levels, and the mean sea levels, would accelerate coastal erosion, inundate wetlands, estuaries, and islands, and make coastal zones more variable to storm surges.
So here we can see the change in the glacier from 1938 to 2006. We can also see an el ice albedo feedback in the Arctic Ocean. So warming at high latitudes means shrinking sea ice covers, means lower surface albedo, means greater absorption of solar energy, means warmer warming at higher latitudes, which means shrinking of sea ice, and this can continue on and on. So here we see the sea ice in the northern hemisphere polar region and this was September of 2008 and this is March and also shown as March of 2009 and the p for the potential impacts of global climate change some of the other impacts would be higher temperatures and more frequent droughts may affect food production and of possible concern for an increase in hurricane intensity due to the high sea surface temperature. So we need improved models of the climate systems are needed to better assess the effects of warming on hurricane activity. We could also see some ocean acidification so CO2 that is absorbed by the ocean precipitates in chemical reactions that increase the acidity, so lowers the pH of ocean water. This is potentially harmful to marine organisms that use the carbonite ions to build calcium carbonate shells or skeletons. And of course these marine organisms that are particularly vulnerable to ocean acidification. And these are all important food source in the marine food webs. We also see that the corals, which filter plankton from the ocean water and secrete calvin and calcium carbonate, are also vulnerable. So that concludes this lecture, and thank you for your time.